<clears throat> Hello, Tushy Delay, good afternoon, good morning. I'm Tsering Pasang and uh, I'm speaking from London and I'm going to be the moderator for today's very, very interesting discussion with two amazing guests. Uh, Mr. Kasulov Sanyendala from New York and Tinsita Ye Kansala from Canada. Uh, today's discussion, it's very, very topical. Biden, she, and Tibetan freedom struggle. Before I give you the background of today's discussion, let me first introduce my two very, very important guests. Kasul Lopsa Nyandala is a leading 2021 Sikyong candidate who was the calling for <clears throat> the Department of Information and International Relations of the Central Tibetan Administration, or otherwise known as the Foreign Minister for the Tibetan government in exile, based in Dharamsala. He was also a former finance and health minister from 2001 to 2006. He's also a diplomat. He was also a diplomat, the representative of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, based at the Office of Tibet, then in New York. Before he became the minister at the age of 35, Lop Sangyendala was an elected member of the Tibetan parliament from, 19, from 1996 to 2001. In his 20s, Kasu Lop Sangyendala was an activist with the Tibetan Youth Congress, the largest Tibetan non governmental organization based in exile. He was a general secretary in the central office of the Tibetan Youth Congress to monitor human rights situation inside Tibet and to promote democracy in the Tibetan community. Lopsang Yendala set up this Tibetan Center for Human Rights and Democracy and served as its founding executive director. This Research Center continues to play a very vital work for the Tibetan cause. When he was the Minister for the Department of Information and International Relations, Kasul Lopsang Yendala visited Beijing and Tibet and had met with senior officials engaged in direct dialogues with the Chinese leadership in 2006. He is currently a member of the Sino-Tibetan Negotiation Task Force and president of the New York-based Tibet Fund. My next guest is Tenzin Targel Kangsa from Canada. Tenzin Kangsa is currently a venture advisor for founders of high growth companies. He helps founders to scale both their minds and businesses. Politically, Pinzila is a current member of the Sino-Tibetan Negotiation Task Force, a vice chair of the Asia-Pacific Democratic Union, which is all right of the right of central parties in Asia and North America, and former Chief of Staff, former Chief of Staff to senior Canadian cabinet ministers and advisor, an advisor in Office of Prime Minister of Canada. He was also founding executive director of Canada Tibet Committee. Now, before we show a short video clip, I want to touch on this, the background for today's discussion, as we have both guests here today. 
we have just recently witnessed the US elections. The world has been watching the US elections very, very closely. Needless to mention that both Beijing and Dharamsala too have been watching the political developments in Washington very, very closely. The incumbent President Donald Trump was defeated by his political opponent. President-elect Joe Biden is due to take the oath of office on 20th of January 2021. That's in two months time. For the Tibetans, President, President Trump is seen as one of the toughest US presidents against China. In addition, as we all know, there's a growing shift in global attitudes towards China. The Wuhan COVID-19 pandemic, which has caused unprecedented disruptions worldwide, has also helped to expose China's lies and its cover-ups. The Chinese regime in Beijing has also been openly asserting its global interests, including President Xi Jinping's ambitious One Belt, One Road initiative. In recent years, particularly early this year, the border clashes between India and China has questioned their long-term relations. Now, before we have a sort of proper discussion with my very two important guests, I would like to show a short clip from Kasulop Sanyantala's recent announcement of his major policy in New York. So let's uh, see this um, clip. Ani Okay, welcome back. Let me welcome my guests back again. In the council life. Oh, great. Okay, um, before we go into this uh, clip and uh, on your major policy, uh, I would like to pose this question to both of you. I would like to invite Kasulov uh, Sanyandala to answer this question, uh, share your thoughts first, then I'll come back to uh, Tinzila. Now, what would be the US-China relations under President-elect Biden, Kasulov Sanyandala? No, thank you, thank you very much uh, for you know, uh, uh, this uh, panel discussion. I am pleased that Kasulov uh, is uh, with us today. Uh, you know, you are right. Many Tibetans, uh, you know, feel that President-elect Biden would be uh, softer uh, on on China. Uh, you know, in appearance, maybe because Biden has a different, uh, you know, personality than the present incumbent uh, President Trump. Uh, but in substance, uh, I think uh, Biden will be equally hard on China. And I say this because there are several reasons why there already has been a fundamental change in the uh, sino tibetan so sino uh, us relations uh, over the past uh, few years. And uh, 
across the United States uh, political parties, uh, be it be Democrats or Republicans, uh, you know, they believe that the successive U.S. administrations have failed uh, to uh, to transform China. So, which means that the engagement policies that they had in the past, you know, 30, 40 years have failed to reform China in a way that the international community wanted them to see. And, and therefore, uh, you know, it's, it's very hard on the new administration uh, led by uh, Biden uh, to to play any soft you know policy on, on on China and also because if you look at what Biden has done in the past uh, you know especially during his uh, his campaign time uh, you know Biden has made it uh, very clear that he will never tolerate any kind of human rights abuses uh, you know in, in China and then he also made it very clear that he would continue with the uh, you know, President Obama's uh, pivot to Asia policy, uh, meaning that he will emphasize on the importance of, of Asian region, uh, whereby challenging the hegemony of China in the region. And similarly, you know, if you look at, uh, you know, what he said in the recent past is that uh, he wanted to move almost 60% of the U.S. sea power uh, to Western Pacific. That also means that he is challenging the maritime claim uh, of, of China in, in, in that region. So, you know, looking at his own, uh, uh, you know, uh, position on China, as well as uh, the general uh, political atmosphere of the United States, I believe that Biden will definitely be you know, very tough on China. But at the same time, what I'm hoping is that uh, you know, he will be able to engage Chinese leaders in such a way that there will be a hope for a better, uh, you know, uh, uh, political changes taking place in China. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I think we'll have further discussion later on now. I would like to welcome uh, Tizi Councillor. What are your thoughts? Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me to Dinglah. Um, good to be here. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone on this call. I, I think I'll start off my comments by essentially saying, you know, we live in interesting times right now where nobody knows anything about the future, right? These are a very uh, volatile times. Uh, having said that, you know, if you look at you know what President Trump has already done and his actions that he's taken on, on specifically on, on China policy, you know, even as recent as some of uh, the viewers and, and we we acknowledged earlier in the call, sitting La is that you, you see Losa, you know, Losa Sange was just received officially in the White House, right? And, and the way that I look at this as a Tibetan, as a Tibetan who's you know, been active in, in, in the Tibetan freedom movement as well as serving in the government is that these are examples of the bar being set higher and higher and higher, right? So regardless of who's in power, you know, these types of actions like having a Sikkim Lafsan Sangye invited to the White House, like the actions that President Trump took that were quite firm and quite principled against China, these are, um, these are uh, actions that have set the bar higher and that, you know, incoming President Biden will, in my opinion, have to respect. It'll be very difficult in terms of public opinion to go backwards, right? Um, there's, there's a wonderful global focus group and initiative from the Pew Institute. And it recently said that, you know, the global public opinion, not the opinion of a politician, but the public opinion of China has never been worse since Tiananmen massacre, right? And I think we all know that po politicians must acknowledge and pay attention, if not respond to, you know, the, the opinion of the voters. So, you know, it's, it's my view that President Biden, you know, of course we wish him well, we, we, we wish him to continue the principled stand and the courage to stand up to China and be a voice for Tibetans and Uyghurs and a lot of the oppressed communities and groups within China. But it's my view that you know, the bar has been set and that President Biden, because of the public opinion and where it sits today, specifically in the US, but also around the world, that President Biden will, will not go lower than the bar that's been established by President Trump. That's very optimistic. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think it's a great news uh, that uh, Sikyong Sangye is uh, uh, 
uh, has stepped uh, uh, inside the White House uh, for the first time in the last nine uh, years. Um, now we talk, we are talking about the negotiations or dialogue, but we haven't seen any dialogues between Dharamsala since Sikyong came to uh, to the office of Sikyong over the past uh, uh, nine, ten years. So now let's go more into our uh, uh, discussion on Sino-Tibetan negotiations. Prof. Sanyenta, I'd like to ask you uh, questions. Now, you recently made a very, very bold uh, special policy announcement around Sino-Tibetan negotiations just last week. Can you please start uh, this discussion by explaining this special policy announcement again in English so that our viewers can uh, understand? Uh, yes, uh, indeed, I made uh, uh, a special policy announcement uh, during my first uh, public meeting uh, at the uh, Tibetan Community Center in New York City. <clears throat> at the, it's about, um, you know, uh, my firm commitment to, uh, to, to San Tibetan dialogue. Uh, you know, I have declared that uh, during my uh, first term in office, if I'm not able to uh, re-establish, uh, you know, a uh, dialogue between the Chinese, uh, you know, Tibetans and Chinese uh, officials, uh, I would not seek re-election. Uh, so that shows my determination. And I also explain my uh, plan of actions in terms of, uh, you know, how I will be able to, uh, you know, uh, uh, create an atmosphere uh, for a conducive dialogue. At the same time, have different action plans to ensure that the dialogue could take place. And uh, you know, what I understand is that each and every Tibetan, you know, agree that uh, uh, there is no more important, uh, you no know, responsibility of the CTA than finding an amicable solution to the Tibet issue. And therefore, uh, you know. We have to really make our efforts. Time is very critical. You know, if we are not able to uh, resolve the issue of Tibet in the next five to ten years, uh, you know, there is a there is a, a risk that we may not be able to sustain our uh, you know our freedom struggle in the in the long run. So, therefore, I think it's very important that we need to uh, you know, consider this as the most important. Uh, goal uh, for the exalted Tibetan people. And, uh, you know, I, I feel that the atmosphere is also uh, pretty conducive in terms of uh, engaging the Chinese leader, uh, primarily because we have all seen that the world has changed, uh, you know, uh, uh, significantly. Uh, uh, just now we talked about the, you know, the changes, the fundamental changes uh, taking place in the United States. Uh, we have uh, heard, uh, you know, in, in recent days that the uh, the U U.S. State Department released a report stating that, uh, you know, China is trying to revise the world order, uh, you know, uh, around their own uh, totalitarian model. So this is something uh, that United States and uh, other countries in the world, particularly advanced and democratic countries in the world, are very much, uh, you know, concerned about. Uh, they believe that this is a, a threat uh, to the very survival of the liberal ideas and values. And they also believe that China's rise is a threat to its national security. So there are many reasons why China being a member of this uh, you know, you know, world community have to act positively if they have to survive uh, and, and, and uh, progress in this, in this world community. So I'm hopeful that uh, uh, China will you know, gradually transform itself into a, into a, you know, a responsible uh, member of the world community. And, and, and you know, we would uh, find a situation where uh, Tibetans could uh, uh, you know, press hard uh, to the Chinese authorities to engage into a meaningful uh, negotiation. Obviously, <clears throat> the natural question comes to my mind is why is the timing good now? And why are, why, why are you the one as Sikyong to make this happen? 
Yes. In terms of why the timing is favorable, I just mentioned, uh, you know, because of the uh, you know, uh, uh, the fundamental geopolitical shift that is taking place uh, in, 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 in the world today. Uh, you know, only thing is the Tibetan side, we have to push a little harder uh, and, 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 you know, we will be able to uh, do that. Uh, and why me? Uh, you know, I always feel that uh, when I compare myself with other potential candidates for Sikyo, uh, I believe that I have the most uh, you know, extensive experience uh, dealing with the Chinese leaders. I have been uh, to Tibet, to China, uh, met with a number of Chinese leaders, officials, I've engaged with Chinese uh, scholars uh, and, and many other ordinary Chinese to understand the mindset of the Chinese uh, you know, people. At the same time, to, to establish uh, networks and relations with those uh, to whom we have to talk to finally. And this is, uh, you know, one area that I feel that I'm, you know, uh, I, I don't claim myself as, as an expert, but I feel that I'm, I have the most, uh, you know, extensive experience compared to other candidates. Uh, and, and therefore, uh, you, know, uh, you know, I am different from others. And at the same time, I have a very uh, a clear and uh, specific uh, plan of action. So how do I, uh, you know, make the... Uh, you know, uh, Sanity and dialogue possible, and at the same time to uh, to find a solution uh, that would be beneficial not just for the Tibetan people uh, to the Chinese uh, as well. Thank you. Now, Tizi Councillor, as you are you were in the Canadian government as chief of staff for senior ministers and also in, as an advisor in uh, in the office of the prime minister uh, in Canada. What are your frank thoughts about Kasulop Sanyandala's special policy? Yeah, I'll answer that question in a few ways, but I think, you know, just strictly from a, a political campaigning perspective, right? Uh, there's a great saying for those of us who've been in politics. We, we, we like to joke around and say, uh, politics is like the mafia. You can never really quit, right? So, so, so purely from a campaign perspective, I think it's wonderful and commendable that you know, Kasur Losan Yendala has made, you know, the, the, the resolution of the Tibetan issue through dialogue and negotiations as his primary and first priority. Because what I observe in many campaigns, you know, another great saying is, you know, when everything is a priority, nothing is a priority, right? And I think, I think a reflection of strong leadership is when you have a very clear priority, right? And you know, I, I think it's commendable, and, and I like to applaud Kasur Loso Nindala for making negotiations and dialogue his top priority. Now, to the extent that, you know, he's boldly saying if there's not substantive progress in his first mandate, if elected, he won't seek a second uh, mandate. So, so my first, you know, response to Kasur Loso Nindala's uh, campaign commitment is really the boldness of focus, right, and prioritizing this as a number one issue. From a political, governmental perspective, you know, I share Kasu uh, Mosanyendala's opinion that the timing is really good now. You know, there, there's, it's very obvious that COVID-19 has been a tremendous uh, global tragedy, but somewhere in this tragedy, there is opportunity for the Tibetan freedom movement. And, you know, we can all observe now that countries are finally having the courage to stand up to China, you know, to use their voice and to say, we do not agree with what you're doing, right? So we, you know, as an important part of getting China to the negotiation table, we all know that China is not an island. And as more and more countries have the courage to speak, as more and more countries have the courage to work together, which I believe is part of Los Angeles' uh, coalition building uh, efforts as part of his commitment, uh, this is where we could work as an international community now more than ever you know, when the courage and the will is there, then it's up to leaders like Los Yendela to bring those like-minded nations together and really encourage, if not force China to the negotiation table, you know. And you know, I also, I'd like to share, you know, in, in the business world that I work in, you know, just purely on the business level, what I'm seeing is that very large companies and small companies, they're currently shifting their supply chain away from China, right? And this is very significant, right? You can even bracket politics, you could bracket the Tibet issue.
But when the business community is saying, I need to move away from China, I need to stand away from China for reasons of optics, because my clients don't like products made in China, because the, the, the security of my supply chain, I cannot rely on China. This is very significant. And th these are these are tectonic plates slowly shifting and that are you know helping to almost chip away at the you know the the optics or the or the myth that China is just you know cannot be defeated in any such way. So you have the business community moving away, you have countries becoming more and more courageous, and then you have the people. You know, again, COVID, a, a tremendous, you know, tragic you know, event. We're still living through the, the instability and the tragedy of COVID. But I, I think Lothanyanda well, sees that there's also an opportunity in COVID in that the, the eyes of the world are opening, right? Whether that's businesses, whether that's governments and politicians, and whether that's people. So really, you know, this, this is a very unique window of opportunity for a leader and a future CEO, we hope, like Los Angeles, to focus and make this the singular top issue of the Central Tibetan administration and the Tibetan people. So uh, I really would like to applaud Casa Los Angeles for having the courage of, have, of making this our top priority. Okay, I want to bring in uh, Casa Los Angeles here now. Let's talk about the details of your po special policy announcement. You mentioned, you mentioned three specific steps to realize sustain, uh, substantive dialogue. Can you please elaborate? Well, thank you. Yeah, first of all, let me let me thank uh, Tesla Council also for you know your uh, you know agreement and support to my uh, you know view. And uh, yes, I did share three different strategic plans. Uh, you know, at at my uh, New York uh, City town hall meeting, mm -hmm. uh, one of them is. Uh, strengthening the existing Tibetan task, uh, Tibetan task force you know, that we have in Dharamsala. I really wanted to review and revamp the composition of the uh, members, as well as allocate, uh, you know, roles and responsibilities uh, to each of each, each of the members. And I also wanted to expand uh, the existing uh, task force secretary that we have in Dharamsala. Uh, I, I wanted to uh, hire experts who can really, you know, do research and understand not just the development, uh, you know, uh, taking place inside China, but at the same time, you know, China and international relations. Uh, and then also in terms of how, uh, you know, uh, different uh, possibilities are there for us to, uh, to, to move forward in terms of, uh, you know, uh, negotiation. And, uh, and and another thing is, I also wanted to constitute uh, an advisory board uh, comprising of uh, external experts uh, and uh, and and representatives of you know Tibetans from diverse uh, political uh, opinions. So in that way, we can have uh, you know uh, different perspectives in terms of uh, you know strategizing ourselves. In, uh, in 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 uh, moving forward to uh, Sino Tibetan dialogue, so these preparations are extremely important. Unless and until we are all you know uh, inwardly prepared ourselves, it's impossible for us to really strategize in in a you know a better manner. The second uh, strategy that I have is to is to generate international uh, community support. In, and of course, you know, there's no doubt that uh, unless we have substantial uh, and concrete uh, support from the international community, it is not uh, uh, you know, easy for us to uh, reach out to the Chinese authorities. We always need some level of uh, pressure from the international community for China to, uh, to come to a negotiating table. And, and, uh, and there are several action plans. Uh, one of them is to, uh, to, to establish uh, like-minded countries, uh, you know, a coalition, uh, which of course is very important because as we talked about the, uh, the suitability of the situation now, and it's much more easier for us to uh, reach out uh, to like-minded countries and to, uh, to, to, you know, be very specific in terms of our demand, why we need, uh, you know, uh, uh, 
urgent settlement of the Tibetan issue. And then the second thing that I wanted to do is uh, to reach out to as many uh, Congress and parliaments, uh, you know, as possible in the world, and uh, and you know, lobby to pass a resolution supporting, uh, you know, uh, China uh, Sino Tibetan dialogue and a peaceful resolution of the Tibet issue. This could also, uh, you know, result into more international awareness and support. And at the same time, it's also important for public to engage ourselves, and that would be, uh, you know, organizing an international conference called Future of Tibet. You know, this is just to demonstrate that uh, the urgency, uh, you know, uh, the nature of, uh, you know, situation in Tibet, and therefore uh, the world should be concerned about the future of Tibet, and time is critical, and therefore having organizing this kind of conference at a very uh, you know, high level, high profile, uh, you know, I'm hoping that the international community would definitely agree and support the, uh, the uh, you know, need for a uh, negotiation uh, to resolve the issue of Tibet. And similarly, you know, I am planning to organize a massive mass movement uh, called Save Tibet uh, movement. Uh, this is, again, the, uh, the goal is the same. Uh, creating awareness on the current situation inside Tibet and why the international community uh, needs to support us urgently. And uh, and then the last plan that I have, which I wanted to do it within the first year of my term, if elected, is to organize an international uh, Tibetan uh, Buddhist conference. And this is something, you know, Tibetans have not taped in uh, because uh, you know, this is one of the most, I believe, uh, you know, potential kind of power that we have. Uh, Tibetans, you know, in, in, since the 13th century, we have been in some way leading, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, many parts of the world in terms of, uh, you know, becoming a teacher in many ways, not just uh, confined to uh, you know, 6 million Tibetan people, but many of the neighboring countries, including Mongolia, uh, you know, Himalayan regions in India, in Nepal, and, and also, you know, uh, you know, there are several uh, peoples under Russia, you know, Kalmykia, Tuva. So there's so many uh, Buddhist communities scattered uh, all over the world. And even in the United States, for instance, it is said that the fastest growing religion in North America is, is Tibetan Buddhism. So therefore, uh, you know, uh, we have such a potential, uh, uh, you know, where we can uh, get uh, support and sympathy and understanding. So this could be another action plan that, uh, you know, I have in mind. And the third strategy is that we have to explore every possible avenues to reach out, uh, you know, uh, uh, to the Chinese government, uh, both, uh, a, you know, uh, formally and informally using different channels. So that I'm willing to do. I, as I said, I already have uh, some uh, basic experience and understanding of how China works, uh, where to reach out to. But uh, but at the same time, I appreciate uh, you know, a number of countries uh, when they engage China in you know bilaterally and and how their strategies work. And I'm sure that uh, you know eff effort has to be made. As I said, you know this is my going to be my top priority uh, and then therefore i have to uh, you know uh, put all my energy and resources into making this happen thank you very much uh, um you have really sort of thought out and uh, have such detailed strategies and i've never heard of such things from anybody or even of the past 10 years or, or so i mean i would like to bring this counselor back now i mean you have been uh, along with uh, uh been the members of uh, current uh, well current task force on sino tibetan negotiations now how does what lobsan yandela has suggested compare with the current reality of the task force and its proceedings? Okay, it's a little bit of a tricky question there, Ting Lao, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, of course, uh, you know, I'm very uh, proud to serve alongside Lobsan Yindala on this uh, Sino-Tibetan negotiation task force. Uh, of course, we can't 
uh, you know, share openly the deliberations of that of that important committee. But I, I want to come back and, and, and pick up on some of the things that Lofsan uh, Lofsan spoke about. And one very important part is the you know working with like-minded nations, right? And I mean, we have to we as Tibetans and our Tibetan supporters, we, we have to face the reality that you now we can neither outnumber or outspend communist China, right? We have to accept that. And what's left on us is basically to outsmart China. And I think, you know, and, and how you do that usually as an organization is to have the clarity and the discipline of focus. So again, I think it's wonderful that Lofsanla wants to make you know, substantive dialogue and negotiations the top focus of his mandate if elected Sikyong. And you know, within our Tibetan ecosystem of Tibetans, uh, the CTA, our, our overseas offices, and of course supported by the very important Tibet support groups, you know, we have to ask ourselves, you know, if, if we have a singular focus, if we have one very clear North Star, will that make our collective efforts more effective? You know, I believe the answer is yes, right? Especially with the clarity of focus that Los Angeles has provided. You know, we, we have to also ask ourselves that if we're, if we're scattered and our limited resources are spent you know, doing advocacy and education to a number of places where we have to you know, honestly assess, you know, is this the most efficient use of our very limited resources, right? Now, I will throw out there just on a personal note, you know, can, can, can the Tibetan movement, you know, ultimately rely on the United Nations and the United Nations Human Rights Council, which has members like China and Iran and North Korea on its, on its steering committee, can we really rely on the United Nations to, to deliver results for the Tibetan cause? These, these are questions we have to seriously ask, and, and, I, and I believe Osan Yendala is asking those questions when we're saying, let's work with the like-minded countries, right? It, it, it's, you know, Los Alas is presenting a plan that, you know, when, when you can imagine that Sikyong is traveling around the world, you know, uh, as soon as a Tibetan leader enters the room, we have to believe that that, politi that politician or that senior government official already has sympathy for the Tibetan people. I think we could say that we've had enough sympathy, frankly, in the last 60 years. It's now up to a leader like Los Alas to say, thank you for your sympathy. Now here is my concrete plan, and here is how I'm working with other nations. Please join us on this very specific action plan that I have. I believe that's what's been missing in our in our Tibet movement for for the last few decades. Everyone is working very hard, whether it's current Sikyong, past Sikyongs, uh, this Kashag or our previous Kashag. But the clarity of showing a roadmap to countries who are clearly sympathetic, and today they are clearly ready to stand up to China. We need a clarity of a plan from a leader like Los Angeles to say, this is, this is my plan. And these are the nations that are working with me. You know, we have to exude that energy of being in the driver's seat of our, of our struggle and not in the passenger seat and saying, Kuchi, Kuchi, please help us. Right? I think we have to get past that. Mm -hmm. And I think Los Angeles really provides that with the clarity of, uh, of his focus on substantive negotiations uh, with China to resolve the, the Tibetan issue. Uh, coming back, to, uh, sorry, uh, coming back to your, your first question about this task force, you know, I believe, you know, if, if speaking from my experience in the Canadian government, there, there are task force, there are advisory committees, there are a number of these committees that exist. I think at the end of the day, it's, it's up to a leader and, and or the leadership to say, you know, will you genuinely and authentically engage your advisors or your committee or your task force to do something different, right? There are, there are some leaders, leaders in governments uh, that like to have these task force because optically it's the right thing to do. But I, I think what Lofsala is tabling in his vision is, you know, and, and how I've known him for a number of years is he, he's generally a man that listens to advice. He's generally a man that likes to hear the best ideas regardless of what strife or background you have. And, and he'll think about it and then he'll act on it. So I believe that that type of leadership and that type of energy that he would bring to a future task force and, and again, I commend him that he would uh, make this one of his top priorities within the first 100, 100 days to bolster and, and establish a, a new advisory committee, specifically on negotiations. I think it's that type of thinking that will, you know, again, raise the bar internally for our Tibetan movement to really change things up when it comes to negotiations and dialogue. Thank you, uh, Dinsen Councillor. That's, uh, that's uh, uh, very, very uh, helpful here. 
for our um, <clears throat> viewers as well. And if we have any questions coming from the audience, I will take that up as well. Uh, now, uh, what I'll do is I'm going to ask one more question to Kasudo uh, Sanyantala. Uh, and after that, I have a couple of more questions to you, uh, Tinsi Kansala. And if you want, if you wish, I can, uh, I'll give you opportunity to ask a couple of questions to Kasudo uh, Sanyantala um, once, once he answers my next question. Okay, Kasudo Sanyantala. You can hear me, right? Yes, please. Yes, I do. Now, sh should Tibetans really believe that governments are now ready to stand up to China and participate in your like-minded coalition of nations to force China to the negotiations table? Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm very optimistic. And I say this because uh, in the past number of years, the you know, United States, along with other Western countries, have failed to understand the true nature of the Chinese government. And now today, everyone you know agrees that uh, uh, the past China policy, uh, what we call is a policy of appeasement, is is totally wrong. Uh, it's, it's simply because you know they have been hoping that if we engage with China, if we have you know, policy that are appeasing to the Chinese leaders, that you know, eventually they're hoping for China to open up and transform itself uh, to become a, you know, a responsible uh, member of the world community. But this has all proved wrong. Now everyone agrees that we, we need a new China strategy uh, based on the ground reality, not just you know, uh, not just that we uh, expect or hope China to become in the future, and with this now new reality, uh, you know, everyone is uh, kind of you know uh, uh, standing up against China. Uh, just uh, I think two three days ago, uh, U.S. State Department issued a report saying that China now is uh, you know planning to revise uh, a new world order, uh, which is which is very harmful for the international community. And, and also, uh, you know, there are uh, different governments, you know, who are standing up against the Chinese uh, uh, leaders today. So given the political uh, changes and scenario, I, I believe that it's much, much easier for us to engage uh, like-minded, uh, you know, uh, nations uh, in, in supporting, uh, you know, uh, Tibetan people and Tibetan cause. Uh, you know, unfortunately, if I give an example about uh, the the current uh, U.S. Uh, administration, even though they have been very, very hard uh, and and you know critical on China, uh, you know, uh, somehow they have left out completely left out Tibet issue uh, in 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 U.S. China. Uh, relations. Uh, they did take up, uh, you know, the uh, Uyghur issue. They did take up on numerous occasions the Hong Kong issue, uh, but they never even once uh, mentioned uh, Tibet. But now, what I understand is that not only Joe Biden, who is ha who has already declared that he would join hands with allies to to put pressure on China, and he also declared that he would. Uh, uh, prevail upon the Chinese leaders to, uh, you know, pressure Chinese to engage uh, with the representative of His Holiness the Dalai Lama. So there are uh, many such uh, statements and uh, you know understanding uh, which are very conducive for us. And therefore, I believe that the it's 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 much more easier today than it was you know uh, maybe five ten years ago to engage the uh, like-minded nations and, and therefore, uh, you know, work towards uh, achieving, uh, a, 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 you know, a, a solution that is beneficial for both the uh, Chinese and the Tibetan peoples. Tittingly, if I may, I'll pick up on some of those comments by Los yeah. Allah. Um, you know, there may be a number of Tibetans around the world, including American Tibetans, who, who may be a bit uh, saddened that uh, President Trump is no longer leading the charge and standing up to China. 
But another way to look at, you know, how will the world change under the leadership of President-elect Biden is, I think there's no doubt by, by whether you're, you're pro-Trump or anti-Trump that Biden in, in his leadership style will be much more conducive to a multilateral approach to world problems, right? Whereas Trump was more of a, of a one-man show. So, you know, I think that's exactly complementary to what, you know, Los Angeles is proposing in terms of like-minded nations. And in fact, in the international uh, you know, government setting, there's a precedence for this. It's called the International Contact Group. These are formal groups where like-minded nations come together and they work on a very pressing, urgent problems. There, there's been international contact groups for Somalia. There have been contact groups or other initiatives. So in, in essence, I'm, I'm using kind of international government talk now. Apologies for those of you who, uh, who uh, for, for, for tolerating my government speak for now. But essentially what Los Angeles is, is, is focusing on, which is very, which is commendable, is like-minded nations, right, to come together. And we all know that the U.S. must be one of those countries, right? They, they have a Tibet coordinator. The, the mandate of that Tibet coordinator is to work with other countries. So, you know, I think we, we as Tibetans and our supporters must be optimistic that under a, a Biden presidency, that the world conditions for multilateral interventions are better than compared to Trump. And then with a, you know, a, a Sikyong leadership of Los Angeles, I think the, the multilateral like-minded nations a formula is much more uh, is much more achievable, right? Under a Biden leadership and, and Los Angeles leadership, uh, so I, you know I think it's it's very important to point out that you know it's my own view that you know if we live in a G two type world where it's China and U.S. just fighting, you know there may be some of us you know Tibetans and Tibet supporters that feel in the short term that feels nice, but in the longer term it really requires a number of nations to work together to really press China to, uh, to negotiate and settle on the Tibetan issue. Sri Basla, I think one important thing that we also need to understand is that, uh, well, Ch China will not stay silent. You know, they'll not, never stay quiet. And then the, uh, you know, uh, we have seen uh, just a few days ago, uh, China joined, uh, 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 you know, it is said that the largest ever trade agreement, uh, you know, uh, RCEP, regional, uh, I think it's uh, our sub regional comprehensive economic partnership, uh, you know, uh, with with especially with uh, uh, Asia Pacific. So when they when they you know are engaged with this kind of e e economic pact, uh, EU has already come out by saying that now it is a wake up call, you know, for for uh, for the United uh, sorry European Union and the and the United States to join hand. And and also this shows that EU is now hoping or, or 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 wanting the United States to lead, and because also uh, many of the European leaders, you know, trust that Biden uh, could be a good coalition partner. Mm -hmm. uh, but having said that, uh, you know, China again will definitely, uh, you know, uh, have will have their own strategic plans to uh, move forward to to assert its own influence and power. Uh, mm -hmm. and, 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 but at the same time, now we can hope for a world where, uh, you know, uh, many uh, countries in the world will be able to stand up against the, you know, Chinese uh, might. Okay. Now, before I ask you a, qu a couple more questions, Tinsley Council, do you have uh, any anything to ask to uh, Kasula? <laughs> um. No, I, I think we can open up. But we're already about one hour in. Maybe we invite some of the uh, the viewers to ask questions, or maybe you have more questions sitting left. Sure, sure. Okay. Uh, what I'll do is I'll ask you uh, uh, one more question here. Uh, you were a senior, uh, as I said earlier, you were a senior advisor in the Canadian government. Uh, we saw great results and courage from the then Prime Minister Stephen Harper, uh, Harper on Tibet issues. Uh, you are currently vice chair of the Asia Pacific Democratic Union which is a group of right of center parties in Asia, North America. Do you agree that countries now have more courage? Do you agree that countries have uh, more courage to stand up to China? Absolutely, absolutely. I think again, through the, 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 the tragedy of COVID, there's an opportunity for the Tibetan freedom struggle. I, I, you know, ultimately, 
politicians are accountable to the sentiment and, and the trends of, of the voters. And, and it's very clear, even in international global research like the Pew Institute, that you know, the public opinion has never been as negative towards communist China since the days of the Tiananmen massacre. So when the electorate have principles and they're speaking very loud and clear, I believe this also provides courage to the politicians. And for, for two reasons, frankly. One is, you know, it's, it's any smart politician will like to, you know, respond favorably to the will of the people, right? I think that goes without saying. And on the other hand, I think, you know, it's everybody knows, you know, anyone in the international community knows the tragedy of the Tibetan issue. And I think now is a time where countries can say, I've always known about Tibet, I've always had sympathy, but I don't know what to do, right? Uh, you, we hear this all the time, those of us who have you know, non-Tibetan friends, those of us who work in Tibet support groups. And I think now Los Angeles would provide that answer to world leaders, right? Not every world leader, but like-minded nations, uh, uh, you know, an international contact group, if you will, of maybe five to eight countries that can work together. And the U.S. would obviously be in that group to say, okay, let's now work together so that we can move China to come to the negotiation table. So absolutely, the, the, you know, I'm of the view that countries are ready in the past because some countries have acted and were ready. I think now we have more countries that, that'll be ready. And I, these, these are uh, very uh, interesting times and, 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 and there's reason to be hopeful as Tibetans. Okay, thank you. A couple of more questions. Uh, I'm looking at the uh, audience. I don't see any sort of questions so far, but um, this, somebody has made a comment saying that Kosulov Sanyenta has already raised the bar high, bar high with his innovative, practical and bold election campaign in style and substance. I'm sure he will bring the same to our cause if elected uh, Sikyo. Um, I'm checking some more down there. Okay, that, that, that's, uh, that's um, well, another said bold statement from Kasul of Sanyandala. So, okay, I'll, 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 I'll keep that for now. Now, I want to ask another one, uh, another question to this councillor. Huh? And, 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 and after that, I'll come back to you, uh, Kasula. Now, Tinsi councillor, you have been part of, uh, part of many Canadian election campaigns. What are your frank thoughts of this campaign? or of our unique Tibetan democracy so far. I believe you also advised uh, current Sikyong Lobson Sanke, as well as his uh, in his past Sikyong and Kalintiba election campaigns. Okay, uh, uh, yes, I, I consider myself uh, a good friend of, of uh, current Sikyong, Dr. Lobson Sanke, and. Uh, I played a small role in some advice here and there. We're, we're, we're quite active on our WhatsApp and we, we, we speak from time to time. Um, look, I, I think, you know, our Tibetan democracy is, is, is unique, right? Um, I think one area where, you know, really Losanla is commendable is, you know, he was the first to come out and say, I want this job, right? I, th you know, for me, that's very important. Right. This is a this is an incredibly important job, and you know I would like to support a leader that clearly says I want this job. You know I'm first out of the gate. Here is my my plan. Now, here is what I'm focusing on. This is my platform. And, and this is not a criticism of other candidates, but isn't that the basics of democracy? To have a leader that clearly says I want this job, not some type of half answer of you know if. If the people vote me top two, then yes, I want this job. I, I, you know, I really want to say clearly that it's very important to me that there's a leader that says I want this. Right? You know, quite similar, frankly, to you know, Dr. Losan Sange, who who really kind of we have to credit him with, with energizing campaigns. Right? He's very clearly campaigning, saying very clearly to voters, I want your vote, and here's how I'll be different. And and so Losan Yendala brings that to the table, and for me, that's very important. And I ask. Uh, you know, Tibetan, my Tibetan brothers and sisters to really think about that, that, you know, we, we need leadership that clearly says, I want this job. These are my priorities, right? I think that's critical. Um, you know, another unique element of our 
Tibetan democracy is, you know, as I talk to friends around the world, is the emphasis on harmony, right? I, I think we can all agree that the, the freedom struggle is our top priority. And, and harmony is coming up, you know, from a lot of my friends from around the world. These have been, um, you know, you can, some can describe it as divisive times in the last few years in campaigning. And uh, Tibetan, Tibetans have to ask themselves which candidate really represents harmony, right? And, or maybe the opposite of that question also, frankly, is which, uh, and which candidates don't represent harmony. So, you know, when, when I do my own simple processing in my mind about, you know, the Tibetan freedom struggle and prioritizing substantive dialogue and negotiations with China and the importance of harmony, when you really look at those two parts of a, of a formula and an equation, you know, it, it makes me very proud and I'm very confident to endorse and support you know, a, a candidate and a human being like Kasher Losan Yendela. Okay, I think uh, it got uh, Digital Councilor disconnected. No, um, I think we can hear, we can hear Digital Councilor, but somehow the video got uh, frozen. Are you still there, Digital Councilor? No, I think yeah. he, he's going to come back, hopefully. Okay, I think more or less we got what he got to say on the subject. Okay, um, obviously, uh, you you are risking quite a lot uh, uh, for this uh, campaign uh, because you have given really central central attention and priorities on reestablishing dialogue and uh, negotiation. And uh, you are hoping to achieve something within the next like uh, three, four, five years. Uh, and if you don't uh, uh, achieve uh, uh, some considerable sort of um, things over that period, and you are not going to, well, you're not going to uh, seek a re-election. So why, why, why? Uh, you mean, uh, you know, why am I not going to seek re-election? It's primarily because I wanted to, uh, and express my firm commitment uh, towards negotiation, and also to to inform my you know people that I will be able to do it. I'm not going to accept defeat. You know, I definitely would be able to. Uh, you know, I'm pretty confident. I'm going to uh, reestablish the sino Japan dialogue. Not only that, I'm going to uh, you know bring about positive development uh, on, on sino tibetan relationship. So, uh, you know, uh, but if in case, if I fail to do that, you know, I would not hesitate to say that I failed and then I'm not going to run for the next uh, election. Uh, you know, this is simply to express my commitment uh, so that people will take this, uh, you know, statement pretty seriously. Um, uh, Kaza, would you like to make any comment, final comment, before I ask final question to uh, uh, Um it's Just the, the you know, I, I've been involved in many campaigns. I, I've involved, I've been involved in political campaigns. I've served within government. You know, I, I can't emphasize enough the importance of focus and priorities, right? Where, where I've seen governments go wrong and leaders go wrong is really when they don't have priorities. And when everything is a priority, nothing is a priority, right? And so that's one important observation. The second one is, you know, when I speak to many of my Tibetan friends around the world, their, their feedback has been that this campaign has been really lackluster and quite boring when it comes to ambitious policy. We have a number of candidates, all wonderful people. I know some of them personally, they're wonderful human beings. They're all roughly in their 50s. They have good experience. And they all obviously support the middle way, right? But at the end of the day, you know, what are these unique policies? Who's taking the risk with some reward and presenting something different? I think these are important questions that, that our Tibetan brothers and sisters have to really ask, right? And I think today, you see Losan Yandela has tabled one quite ambitious policy as it pertains to negotiations. It, it, essentially, he's saying it's negotiations or bust. This is my top priority. If I don't deliver this in my first mandate, I will not seek a second mandate. That is very bold. That is leadership. And I believe, Losan Yandela, you, you have other special announcements to come. But this, this is what, when I'm talking to my friends, is missing in the campaign. Bold, innovative policy not a number of candidates all saying 
I support His Holiness, of course. I support the middle way, of course. <laughs> we all need harmony, of course. But what are you going to do differently, right? I think these are questions we have to ask, regardless of who you support, because these are very critical times. You now, if I may, you know, I lost my, my dear Bala to COVID this year, right? It was always one of my private dreams and hope as I, since working for a free Tibet as a teenager that we could free Tibet within his lifetime. Well, that's, that's not going to happen. So let's make it happen for a number of other Tibetan elders. Let's make it happen for His Holiness the Dalai Lama and frankly move beyond slogans and just moving beyond a, an obvious support of middle way. It's obvious we support his middle, the middle way. It's obvious we support His Holiness. But which leader is going to do something different? Which leader is going to make this his, his or her number one priority? And then as making that priority, who has the winning plan and the winning team? These are questions we must ask. So for, for me, this election is very critical. And that's why I'm very proud and, and happy to be active and support Los Añandela because when it comes down to you know, negotiations and, the, and, and we all hope the peaceful settlement of the Tibetan issue in the lifetime of our Tibetan elders, including His Holiness, and when it comes to harmony, for me, he is the candidate that clearly represents those two critical elements. And that's why he clearly has my support. Thank you, thanks, Gasla, for your uh, you know endorsement and your support. I truly appreciate it. And as you mentioned, that uh, you know I do have uh, two more uh, major policy announcements to be uh, made in the coming days. In fact, tomorrow in Boston, I have a Tibetan community meeting, so I'm going to announce my second bold uh, policy announcement. And I hope that you know uh, many of Tibetans, my supporters, will uh, be interested in uh, you know hearing that. Okay, and uh, now, fi now finally, Kasulo uh, Sanyandala, I want to ask you this final question. You seem to be very, very optimistic and positive and, uh, about the future of Tibet. Tell me why. Uh, it basically, you know, I, I'm always an optimist person. But in addition to that, you know, my friends like, uh, you know, Tedzi Kansala, yourself and uh, many others, they, you know, always make me more optimistic. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I believe that uh, the future of Tibet is optimistic. Uh, you know, it's always good. And uh, there are many reasons why, again. Uh, first of all, uh, you know, look at our track record uh, in the past 61 years. Uh, Tibetans, uh, you know, several generations have been able to, uh, to the sustain the freedom struggle movement. Uh, we have been able to uh, preserve our uh, cultural and national identity despite uh, you know, so much of difficulties that we and our parents have faced. So, uh, you know, we can certainly be confident that in the coming more years, uh, Tibetans will continue to thrive. There is no question about it. And we also have all the necessary preconditions, you know, to have a better future for Tibetans. You know, one, as I said, is 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 the uh, successful preservation of our cultural identity uh, by both the Tibetans inside Tibet and outside of Tibet. And and we also have you know new generations of Tibetans who are well equipped with modern education. Uh, they're exposed to the international community, you know. So, so we have a new generation who would easily take over the responsibility uh, in in building our future, better future for Tibetan people. And then, in addition to that, you know, we have uh, a very strong leadership uh, who unites the six million Tibetan people, who gives us hope, uh, you know, for for a successful future. And at the same time, we have extremely uh, you know, good uh, Tibetan democratic institutions and leadership. And this will continue to, uh, you know, run in the, in, in, in the years to come, unless, uh, until we uh, find a uh, you know, solution to the Tibet issue. So overall, as I said, given the uh, necessary preconditions that we have, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very confident that Tibetan people uh, will, uh, will, will uh, you know, build our future. But having said that, as the Councillor also mentioned, that we need a leadership who can deliver, uh, you know, in, in the foreseeable future. Uh, and uh, that is to uh, find an amicable solution uh, to, the, to the Tibet problem. 
uh, you know, within the next five to 10 years. And I, I hope that, you know, Tibetan people will trust, you know, in me and, uh, you know, give me this opportunity to, to serve our uh, people at the same time to ensure that some positive development uh, can take place in, in resolving the issue of Tibet in the near future. Uh, thank you so much. Um, you, you, I mean, I know that you have three priorities or three top priorities should you become the pro, uh, next CEO. And today you have really shared in detail your major policy on Sino-Tibetan uh, dialogue and negotiations, you know, re-establishing and then resolving it. And you are even sort of risking, should you not uh, able to achieve uh, such, uh, certain substantial, you know, um, results. You are not going to seek election again. Now, what I'll do is I'm going to give you a few more minutes to talk about your other two priorities. But before that, what I want to say is that you know it is good to be optimistic. But better, you have great plans. I think this is amazing. This is what the Tibetan leadership, uh, Tibetan people are looking for: leader with clear clarity and clear objective and clear vision where you want to go. So I think you have a really wonderful endorsement from some, you know, very expert in this uh, very well known in the Canadian uh, political uh, uh, sort of world, and uh, he's going to support and help you. I think this is amazing. So I'm going to give you a few more minutes to speak on your uh, two other priorities because this is uh, our first sort of uh, uh, English uh, session. So I think there are others who want to hear about your two other uh, key priorities. So. Uh, you know, I will be making the announcement of my second, uh, you know, policy top priority uh, tomorrow in Boston. So I really don't want to uh, spell it out today. And at the same time, you know, the third one, I would take a, a good opportunity to share my, uh, you know, uh, views to Tibetan public in the near, near, in the very near future. But having said that, you know, I have given. A serious thoughts on on these two uh, you know upcoming top priorities, and uh, my campaign manager Tenzin Kansla, uh, you know uh, we have uh, discussed over both of these uh, you know two uh, other priorities in pretty detail. Uh, you know I really wanted to make sure that whatever I say, whatever I do, first I have to believe in myself uh, that you know I will be able to deliver them. It, it's not going to be just a you know, a political slogan or, you know, uh, just to win votes, but I really have to deliver them. And therefore I have, you know, I have given thoughts on both of these, uh, you know, priorities, uh, you know, days in and days out, uh, you know, uh, fortunately, uh, including Tenzi Kansla, some of my very close advisors are uh, happy that, you know, if these, uh, you know, priorities are able to be delivered, uh, our community will definitely benefit, uh, you know, immensely in the coming uh, years. So uh, please, uh, you know, uh, keep patience. Uh, I, I will be making a second an announcement tomorrow in Boston. Okay, okay I want to give you the opportunity yeah, to the Councillor. Okay. If I may, I know we're, we're, we're starting to wrap up this, this great debate, not debate, rather, this discussion. <laughs> There's no debate about Los Yandela being a great candidate for uh, for Sik Young, but, you know, I, I'd really like to ask the viewers and those uh, people who are watching live or who may watch this video later, you know, just, just imagine amongst the Tibetan candidates, you know, imagine each one of them walking into the halls of the White House. Imagine each one of them walking into the Parliament of Canada in Ottawa or, or, or to 10 Downing in London or, or in New Delhi or in Tokyo. And just imagine the you know, the, the, the ideal type of Tibetan leader our movement needs to come in and to have that experience, that gravitas, the presence, the vision and the plan to tell that nation's leader saying, this is who I am, these are the people I represent, and this is my plan, please join me. That's a very important question for Tibetans to ask amongst the candidates. You know, imagine and visualize them walking into the White House, walking into a nation's capital, and explaining the plan and trying to muster, and it's not a given, but it, it trying to motivate that country, that country and that leader to say, yes, I will participate, I will follow your leadership. That's where we're, where we're at in the current you know, time of history in, in our Tibetan freedom struggle. So this is very important and, and, you, you, and everyone's getting 
you know, a, a taste or a preview of how Los Angeles is handling himself. In fact, Los Angeles, you know, even at, at the end of your last town hall in New York, I think it was wonderful to see that even in face of people who were very hostile and negative to you, how you were so composed and how you carried yourself, that may in fact have been the standout of last week's announcement instead of your wonderful policy announcement <laughs> that, that Tibetans saw and how you handled yourself with compassion and composure. And that's a taste of how you would carry yourself in the offices of world leaders to say, follow my plan. This is something very t important that Tibetans have to ask themselves. Who do you see as the most effective leader when they walk into the offices of those other countries and say, this is who I am and this is my plan. Please follow me. Don't just give me sympathy, but please follow me in this action plan. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kassala. Uh, thank you, Kassala Sonia man with a vision and clear idea and where he wants to go. I think this is wonderful what the Tibetan peoples are looking for, to find a resolution to China-Tibet conflict and really hope you know, in the next uh, like five years we have this long protracted issue of Tibet, which is unresolved. You know, we see the conclusion of it when his son is Dalai Lama reaches uh, around 90. So that's wonderful. And I would like to wish you all the very best uh, for your tomorrow's uh, uh, discussion and the announcement and then um, your campaign. And thank you very much once again, Kasulo Sonyanala. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Tsipasla. Thank you, Tsipasla. And thank you, all the viewers. Thank you very, very much. And thank you, Tinsi Kansala, once again. Thank you, Sitting Light. You did a wonderful job as a moderator. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>